Milton begins Paradise Lost in the midst of Satan's story at a really disorienting and unfamiliar moment in a familiar story. Well, familiar anyway if we know the story of Genesis, of the serpent and the forbidden fruit and all the rest of it. The Latin term for starting an epic, or any story, in the middle of things is in medius res, which means, wait for it, in the middle of things. This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature, with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, Episode 3. How to Read John Milton's Paradise Lost, Book 1. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary. Today's topic is John Milton's epic poem, Paradise Lost, first published in 1667, then revised and expanded in various editions to 1674. I should say, actually, that today's episode is the first in a seven-part series on Paradise Lost, covering nearly 11,000 lines in 12 books. And by book, I mean a section of an epic poem, which is typically divided into 12 or 24 books. I'll say more about that and, and other conventions of the epic in a moment. This series will cover the whole poem, though naturally that means some parts will get more attention than others. This is, after all, only one reader's interpretation. There are three sections of today's episode. First, I'll talk about Milton's language, his word order or syntax, as it's called, his verse form. Uh, then I'll look at Milton's subject and his form, the subject of the Christian origin story and his epic similes and comparisons. And finally, we'll look at what happens in Book One of Paradise Lost. We'll break up the book into sections, beginning with the invocation or discussion of its subject, moving to its descriptions, and finally turning to its speeches and debates. In my first episode, I described this podcast's coverage as mostly methodological, not informational. That is to say, about the methods literary critics use to read texts, not what we find there. And particularly, when we're facing very long texts like this one, our first task is to filter. What's important? What matters? And what doesn't? The answer really depends on what questions you're trying to answer, what interpretation you're building as you go. You never know what you're looking for when you start reading a text, especially a long one. Your understanding only emerges gradually and cumulatively as you see connections and contrasts between its various parts. So, in the beginning, note everything. And then as you go, apply more and more filters. As I said, you're noting connections between various parts as you go. So, keep in mind other parts of the text as you move forward. So, you can note cross-references. For example, two characters who talk about a similar subject. Notes are key to your recollection. You're remembering not the whole text, but the version of it that your annotations have recorded. I'll say more about that method at the end of this episode, but as we go through book one, notice how I pay more or less attention to its various parts. Gordon Teske, the editor of the Norton Critical Edition of the poem, writes that, quote, Growing to understand Paradise Lost is a lifelong adventure. That's because this isn't just a long poem at 11,000 lines. It's also a complex poem. I find new layers and new shades of meaning, even after reading it half a dozen times. If you're reading Paradise Lost for the first time, Welcome to one of the most rarefied clubs in the world, those who have conquered this poem. But there's a reason that it's very rarefied, because Milton turns off people who are intimidated by difficult language. How difficult? 
Well, if you've read some Shakespeare, you're in a good position to understand Milton. And the more Shakespeare you've read, the better off you'll be. Milton wrote this poem about 40 years after Shakespeare's death. Teske, the editor, advises first-time readers of Milton to, quote, take the poem in as a performance, not as a riddle. In other words, don't try to solve everything. He elaborates on how to take it in, quote, Milton's poems are not so much works on the page meant to be interpreted as texts as they are structures of sound meant to be heard, to be listened to, even when one is silently reading. So read it with an awareness of how things sound, how words interact with other words, how patterns and oppositions emerge, how arguments and comparisons are made. Incidentally, there are some good audio recordings of the poem, but beware of abridged or shortened versions. A complete recording should be about 10 to 11 hours long. Personally, I like the BBC Radio 4 dramatization with Dennis Quilly and Ian McDermott. One of the first things you notice about Milton's language is its unusual word order, or syntax. The opening sentence of Paradise Lost, Book 1, is ten lines long, and begins with the preposition of. Listen to the first half of that sentence and try to identify two things. First, the main verb, that is, the action. And second, the subject of that verb the noun that the verb is acting on. Of man's first disobedience, and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world, and all our woe with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing, heavenly muse. Did you catch the verb? It's the word that I emphasized sing. What about its subject? What is being sung? The verb subject is five lines earlier. Man's first disobedience. Well, actually, it's a two-part subject. Man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree. The rest of the lines are about the implications of man's disobedience, namely his mortal taste of the fruit, which has a double meaning, both figurative or uh, results slash consequences, and then literal fruit. This was a taste that, quote, brought death into the world by making humans mortal, because before we were immortal, and exiled us from Eden. Until, that is, Christ restores us to paradise, and hence the poem's title. So, one half sentence spans Christian history from the creation of the world to the apocalypse. It's quite the subject, and Milton needs all the help he can find to sing about it. He's addressing the muse, the source of his creative power, and asking it to sing through him, in lines 12 to 13 and 15 to 16, quote, I thence invoke thy aid to my adventurous song that, quote, pursues things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme. So what Milton says here, both about his language and through his language, is this. He intends to write what no one has written before, nor even dared to attempt, in prose or rhyme. By the end of this opening section, lines 25 to 26, we learn what Milton's ambition is. To, quote, assert eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. That is, to help human readers like us understand how God could let man's first disobedience happen despite God's foreknowledge of it. Providence means many things, including foresight. And if God didn't actually cause paradise to be lost, he certainly permitted it. Now, that's a thorny theological problem, a core question in this poem that Milton will raise repeatedly. But we were talking about syntax or word order before I was driven off course. 
The mid 20th century critic F.R. Levis said about Milton's verse that it, quote, calls pervasively for a kind of attention toward itself. And Levis did not mean that as a compliment. Milton was steeped in classical languages, primarily Greek and Latin, languages whose syntax was far more fluid than English. They are primarily inflected languages. That is, their words are spelled in ways that signal their relationships to each other. It's more complex than that, but the effect is that the order of words affects a sentence's meaning far less than it does in English. English words are less often inflected than words in classical languages, so English syntax matters much more. To use my favorite example from Shakespeare, if you say, I wasted time, it's quite different from saying, time wasted me. All of that is to say that Milton used a syntax quite unlike ordinary English because of his familiarity with and admiration for classical languages. So, modern readers face multiple difficulties when reading Milton. Not only is he writing poetry, he's using a 17th century idiom of the English language, that is, 17th century forms and conventions. But, like any foreign language, reading Milton's classicized, antique, and poetic language gets easier with practice. I won't say anything yet about the unfamiliarity of Milton's subject itself. Let's save some fun for later. If you're reading Paradise Lost in the 2005 Norton edition, as I am, before book one there's a brief prose passage titled The Verse. Teske, the editor, rightly describes it as a, quote, somewhat aggressive foreword to the poem published in 1668. It says some very unkind things about rhyme, which Milton calls the, quote, jingling sound of like endings, and describes it as trivial, troublesome, and the invention of a barbarous age, that is, an invention of the Middle Ages, so-called only because they fall in the middle of the classical era and the present age that revives it. The measure, writes Milton, referring to the number of syllables per line, is English heroic verse, meaning ten syllables in niambic pentameter. Of man's first disobedience and the fruit. You'll see in many lines that apostrophes replace syllables that you need to drop. Sing, heavenly muse, that on the secret top, and so on. And yet, despite Milton writing things unattempted yet in prose or rhyme, he's writing neither prose nor rhyme. Prose is the form of fiction, like novels, or, or non-fiction, like the verse and the argument preceding book one. Prose is indifferent to the number of syllables per line because it has no line. Its shape depends only on the page or the medium it appears in. Prose's opposite is verse, not rhyme. Rhyme is expressly not Milton's thing, as he's taken pains to assure us, but clearly declaring that you'll do things unattempted yet in uh, English heroic verse without rhyme is a little bit too unambitious. It's fair to describe John Milton as a man with one foot in the world of literary language and classical learning and the other foot in the world of applied knowledge of human affairs. He lived through political upheaval, a civil war between royalists and republicans ending in the defeat, trial, and execution of a king, Charles I, in 1649, and then followed what Teske calls the political adventure of the interregnum, a decade of republican rule before the restoration of Charles II in 1660. It was an age when you could think and write new ideas. 
things unattempted yet. Milton wrote strident arguments in favor of divorce, against tyrants, against official state religions. He raged against what he called the tyranny of custom, of things that were done more out of habit than of principle. Milton was ahead of his time. These ideas would be championed by French and American revolutionaries in the late 18th century. Despite Milton's public advocacy and his public service, he was equally a learned man of language and literature. As a Cambridge undergraduate, he was proficient in ancient languages, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, and modern French and Italian, along with, of course, his native English. After his degree, Milton took six years to read as widely as possible in these languages, stocking his mind with uh, historical, biblical, cosmological, geographical, theological, and other encyclopedic subjects that he would need to write Paradise Lost. Milton's ambition from a young age was to write the first English language epic following the model of Virgil giving the Roman Empire the Aeneid, just as Homer had given Greece the Iliad and the Odyssey. These are the most ancient and most revered poems in any language. Epics are at the top of the literary hierarchy. Epics display the poet's encyclopedic knowledge acquired through years of study and apprenticeship in lesser genres, and after Virgil, epics were also associated with national prestige. Not only did Virgil's Aeneid explain the origin story of the Roman Empire as a kind of sequel to Homer's Iliad, it also signaled that Latin was a language equal to the prestige of Homer's Greek. So, Milton had both linguistic and nationalist motives to write his English epic. At first, Milton's plan was to write it on a domestic subject like King Arthur and the ancient Britons, but he soon decided that it was more important to give the Christian faith an English epic. Milton's model for this was the Italian epic Jerusalem Liberated of 1581 by Torquato Tasso. It showed that the epic could be successfully adapted to a Christian subject, namely the medieval crusade to recapture Jerusalem from the Muslims. A brief digression. Before Milton, the closest any writer had come to writing an English language epic was Edmund Spencer's vast unfinished poem from the 1590s, The Fairy Queen. It includes the future King Arthur among its sizable collection of wandering knights, but the Fairy Queen owed much more to the medieval conventions of romance, which have their own complex origin stories, but which gave rise to the novel called a roman in French, the first of which was Don Quixote of 1605 and 1615, a subject for later in this series. Spencer's poem is more episodic than epic, though it's more than three times the length of Paradise Lost. End digression. So, what makes a poem an epic? Size matters, but an epic's length is far less important than its internal features. Remember that the next time someone uses epic simply to mean really large, like an epic four-hour film. You'll know better, even if you keep this knowledge smugly to yourself. An epic's internal features include its story and its style. The story is about something momentous, of national importance. It includes humans and supernatural agents, battles and combat scenes, debates and speeches, and long descriptions and lists known as catalogues, often of people. There are other features, both of story and of style, that will arise throughout Milton's epic. Epic style includes extended comparisons called similes, of which more in a moment. Its tone is deliberately even pompously serious, and periodically it calls on a muse for inspiration 
befitting this momentous style and story. That's why Milton's Book I begins with a 26-line appeal to the muse called an invocation. It's as if the whole poem is being dictated to Milton from a supernatural source, and he's just a scribe. I left off earlier at line six, sing, heavenly muse, and that comma is the fulcrum between the weighty halves of this long opening sentence. The first half, about what subject the muse will sing, the second half about the muse itself. That on the secret top of Oreb or of Sinai didst inspire that shepherd who first taught the chosen seed in the beginning how the heavens and earth rose out of chaos. Milton invokes, in other words, the very muse who inspired Moses to relate the creation of the world and the fall of humanity in the book of Genesis, the same muse who inspired King David to write the Psalms. That is a serious ask. But then epics are a serious genre, and Milton has serious ambitions. The way to read Milton's poem is the same way that we achieve anything momentous. We split it into smaller pieces. Start with the major sections. It's 12 books. Then subdivide the books into descriptions and speeches. Do this as you go, noting in the margin who's speaking, whether it's to another character or to themselves. And then, perhaps in another pen color, we sum up what they're saying. As we move forward, line by line, we underline and summarize. And we note questions, contrasts, echoes, parenthetical asides, anything else that strikes our fancy. Paradise Lost is the story of Satan's revenge against God for elevating his son over the other angels. And Satan was one of those angels. In fact, he was an archangel, one of the highest class of angels, second only to God. We'll meet other archangels later in the poem, Raphael and Michael. Forget every image you have of the devil. All the pitchforks and horns and cloven hooves and red flesh. And instead, picture an angel, a winged humanoid figure, genderless, with godlike shapes and forms excelling human, as Milton writes on lines 358 to 59. The angel's form is more grand and dignified than humans, and made of an incorporeal substance that lets angels assume, quote, what shape they choose, dilated or condensed, lines 428 to 29. Angels in other words, resize themselves at will from the tiniest fairy to the largest sea creature. Two similes that Milton uses in Book 1, lines 781 and lines 205. Poetry does many things, but one of its elemental techniques is to compare the qualities of its subject to other things using metaphors and similes. A metaphor is just a figurative comparison. My love is a rose, for example. Not literally, of course, but my love has the qualities of a rose. Beauty, impermanence, thorns, pick your qualities. A simile is an explicit metaphor that uses the words like or as between the subject and the thing compared, which are called the tenor and the vehicle. For example, my love is like a rose. In Epic, there's a convention of using extended similes to compare tenors with vehicles, usually with really long descriptions of the things to which you're comparing your subjects. These are called Epic similes. Look, for instance, at Milton's first description of Satan in lines 192 to 210. Thus, Satan, talking to his nearest mate with head up lift above the wave, and eyes that sparkling blazed. His other parts besides, prone on the flood, extended long and large, lay floating many a rood in bulk, as huge as whom the fable's name of monstrous size, Titanian, or earthbound that warred on Jove, Briarius, or Typhon, whom the den by ancient Tarsus held, or that sea-beast Leviathan, which God of all his works created hugest that swim the ocean stream, 
Him happily slumbering on the Norway foam, the pilot of some small night-foundered skiff deeming some island oft as seamen tell, with fixed anchor in his scaly rind moors by his side under the lee, while night invests the sea and wished morn delays. So stretched out huge in length, the arch-fiend lay chained on the burning lake. I emphasize two tiny yet consequential words in this reading, as and so. Circle them now, if you're following along in your copy, and each time you see the words as or like before an extended description, or in this case to, that ends with so or such, circle them and you'll find they often bookend an epic simile. Find them yourselves. Here are just a few in a simile of my own. As stars in the firmament, those tiny pinpricks of light that viewed close disclose themselves as massive, vivid globes of illumination. So the tiny words in lines 230, 311, and 332 and elsewhere are scattered throughout Paradise Lost Book One. The point of noticing poetic techniques like similes isn't just to unpack their images and ideas, but on the meta level to notice and anticipate Milton's recurrent habits of style. Satan is Paradise Lost's central hero and most compelling character. He gets the best speeches and the most sympathy. His internal psychology is more complex and frankly more interesting than any other character's. For these and other reasons, the romantic poet William Blake wrote a century later that Milton was, quote, of the devil's party without knowing it. Satan's story began long before the start of Book One, with his injured pride that in lines 37 to 38, quote, had cast him out from heaven with all his host of rebel angels. We have to wait until Books 5 and 6 to read the full backstory of Satan's rebellion in heaven. Milton begins Paradise Lost in the midst of Satan's story, at a really disorienting and unfamiliar moment in a familiar story. Well, familiar anyway if we know the story of Genesis, of the serpent and the forbidden fruit and all the rest of it. The Latin term for starting an epic, or any story, in the middle of things is in medius res, which means, wait for it, in the middle of things. When Satan wakes up in hell the morning after the rebellion, surrounded by the other rebel angels on a lake of fire, he looks around at, quote, the dismal situation, waste and wild, a dungeon horrible where peace and rest can never dwell. That's starting at line 60. He rouses his companion Beelzebub to convene the others to discuss in lines 190 to 91 what reinforcement we may gain from hope. If not, what resolution from despair? Books 1 and 2 describe the rebel angels in hell convening to plan and execute their revenge against God. Though they have lost their place in heaven, Satan resolves that they will not change their minds. His most memorable formulation of this comes in lines 254 to 55, quote, The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. But the question still remains, what will they do? How will the downcast rebels avenge themselves? Satan hints at this tactical, tactical question at the end of his opening speech in line 121, quote, to wage by force or guile eternal war against God. And when the, the rebels convene, he uses that word, word guile again in line 645 following, quote, our better part remains to work in close design by fraud or guile what force effected not. In other words, they tried force already and it failed, and now he implies they should try more surreptitious means of revenge. He's open to their advice, as he says in line 659 following, but he's put his thumb on the scale. And so they build a palace called Pandemonium for the Grand Council. 
in Book Two. A key skill of critical reading, as I said in episode one of this podcast, is distinguishing what's critical from what's less important. Critical by what standard, you might be asking? Well, important for what interpretive motive or method? Answering those questions is an exercise in accumulation, the opposite of filtration. At the beginning of a text, you notice every detail. You're working to grasp the writer's style and subject. As you proceed, though, you're using what you already understand to judge the importance of what comes next. And you're using your own interests to determine what provokes your curiosity and deserves your attention. This is all really abstract. So how about I illustrate it with book one? I started this discussion by saying that Satan's character is compelling. And I've said comparatively little about the other rebel angels and quoted none of them. That's for a few reasons. First, I've read the rest of the poem already a number of times. So spoiler alert, I know Satan plays a major role in this story. But, but I also remember reading Paradise Lost for the first time and being struck by the contrast between Milton's Satan and my mental image of Satan as a red-eyed, goat-footed devil with a pitchfork and a bad goatee. I thrilled at his defiant resolution in line 263 that it's, quote, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. It was the same motive that made me root for Iago in Shakespeare's Othello, his masterful language, his rhetorical power. It was stronger than his moral depravity. So, frankly, I cared less about the tedious details of the other rebels' names and their idolatrous worshippers on earth, that catalogue that runs from lines 376 to 521 of Moloch, Chemos, Balim, and Ashtaroth, Thamuz, Dagon, Rimmon, Osiris, Iris, Horus, and Belial. The list is exhausting just to say, and the clouds of references to pagan that is, pre-Christian peoples and places only turn me off more. Frankly, it feels like Milton himself is going through some epic motions here, telling us details that fill out the cosmic implications of this story, i.e. dismissing pagan religions as devil worship. But those details don't advance the story forward, and that's one of my biases, I confess. I skim over details looking for the story of a heroic struggle, a, a quest for revenge from A to B to C, and I'm drawn toward beautiful arguments, particularly when they have an air of forbidden knowledge of devil's advocacy. If you've read Philip Pullman's trilogy, His Dark Materials, the young adult novels, You'll see Milton's god as a tyrannical theocrat, a righteous Ayatollah whose iron fist of intolerance is draped in a velvet glove of benevolence. <clears throat> anyway, where were we? Right, my biases. As a literary critic, you're entitled to be as idiosyncratic as you like about what you're looking for in a text. That makes it your reading, after all. But you'd better be ready to do two things. One, confess your preferences, typically in your introduction. And two, moderate, complicate, otherwise adjust them with the evidence in the text. Don't ignore conflicting evidence. Make it add nuance to your argument. The first, identifying your preferences, gives you a filter to find what matters to you. And yet, despite all I've said in this conclusion, a critic maintains an open mind to where a text will lead them. Don't be dogmatic or doctrinaire or, or take cues from other people's opinions. Read for yourself. See what resonates. Investigate what it means. And build your interpretation one quotation at a time. You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature with Michael Elliott. The next episode is also about hell, an encounter with young lovers who took their reading very seriously in Dante's Italian epic, The Divine Comedy. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. <laughs>
It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash U-L-L-Y-O-T. On the social networks, you can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, U-L-L-Y-O-T at ucalgary.ca. That's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. Ishizaka.